Nice to see it. Um, right, I got a clap before I even got on stage. Fantastic, that's a record. Hello, everyone. My name is Mike Butcher. I'm the editor at large of TechCrunch. I'm also curating a conference on June 16th in London called TheEuropas.com. It's an invitation only conference. Come along. Apply for an invite. Right, that's the advert over. Andrew, you've written a book. Um, you do that now and again. Um, you first came to attention after writing a book called um, uh, The Cult of the Amateur, in which you uh, effectively argued against the rise of social media, saying that uh, amateurs uh, weren't to be, didn't, shouldn't be held in the same esteem as, as professionals, although Kim Kardashian would probably take issue of that. Um, you've now written a new book called The Internet is Not the Answer. Uh, you're uh, effectively, if you'll f forgive me, I think your thesis would be something along the lines of the internet is fantastic, it's a bit new industrial revolution, but we are not aware of its negative effects. Um, but if the internet is not the answer, what was the question? Um, okay, so the, the question is what, what should the operating system be for the 21st century? You tell me. Oh. Um, well, you need to read the book. Um, <laughs> Well, take the example of Uber, for example. Do uh, you think you know, the operating system should not be the internet, then? Is that what you're saying? No. I'm saying that at the moment, the internet is not working as the operating system for the 21st century. What I'm arguing is that at the moment, the internet is not the answer. It doesn't mean it will never be the answer. Indeed, it has to be the answer, because I don't think we really have much of an alternative in a network society. But at the moment, the internet is not the answer to our our biggest concerns. The internet is actually contributing to economic inequality, it's contributing to the job crisis, and it's created this big data economy where we've all been packaged up as the product. The so-called free economy is anything but free. Uh, Google and Facebook and all the rest of these companies are packaging us up. So at the moment, the internet's almost 50 years old. Uh, 1969 was the first computer to computer communication, so in uh, 2019 we'll be celebrating the 50th anniversary of the internet. We just celebrated the 25th anniversary of the web. A and so it, it's growing up, Mike. It's not something that we can indulge anymore, like a five-year-old. It's certainly in its adolescence, maybe even early adulthood. And we, s we need to start looking critically. I mean, you as a tech journalist, uh, particularly at a place like TechCrunch, are notorious for giving this economy, this culture, a free ride. You continually present it as benefiting society, but you're usually wrong. And I think most people, not you personally, but the, but, but the, tech, the tech journalist community. For example, on Uber, uh, Travis Kalanick came here yesterday wearing his, uh, wearing his uh, Jesus garb. Uh, having been the bad boy of tech, we all know the various crimes of Uber. We could spend four or five hours talking about that. So he comes here and says, well, everything, everything's really going to work out. We can deal with Europe. We're going to provide 50,000 jobs. So you, TechCrunch, and all the rest, and you even wrote a piece about it. Uh, oh, this is great. Uh, finally, uh, Uber's going to give something back to society. But I yet, said that that was his pitch. I didn't yeah, but say you, that you, was You treated it answer. fairly uncritically. And the same day, read the, the FT today, the same day that this uh, Kalalnik comes here and spouts this, these lies, basically, uh, Ed Balls and Larry Summer, who are hardly inconsequential characters, came out with a white paper arguing that this so-called sharing economy is not providing real jobs. But this and their is, real concern is, is about middle-class jobs. Your problem is not with the internet. Your problem is with the internet, how the internet is being used. Well, it depends correct? what you define by internet. I mean, the internet is one of those tricky words. It's like us being here in 1812 and talking about industrialization. It's more than just technology. It's more than just pipes. When I talk about the internet, I'm talking about a broad socio-cultural economic revolution. I'm talking about a fundamental shift 
in the way we organize society. Uh, we're in right. Germany, so we can talk in these kind of Hegelian let, terms. Well, let's, let, okay, you mentioned Travis Kalanick, right? So you, uh, he, he said that he could Good guy or bad guy, for in your mind. Is he improving society or not, Mike? I think he's come up with a very interesting business model, which many other people will, c c will uh, copy. Lyft, for instance, in the US is effectively doing, c competing with this. Uh, you, you're, look, how many people, how many taxi, well, let me, tax, let, let, how many rapists are driving taxis right now that aren't connected to the internet? And tell me how many who are in inside Uber cars who are connected to the internet and can be traced and can be tracked down. There's a big difference between the two economies. And I think with Uber, we, we sort of, we, we can pinpoint on this debate. The old economy, for, and it, it is certainly not... The old not, economy well, let me, let me, is not lying. Wait, 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 let me finish, Mike. The old economy, for all its criticism, it's certainly not ideal. I've sat in the back of some really gross cabs around the world. But the old economy works within regulation. They check the background of their drivers. So if someone's just come out of jail and done 10 years for manslaughter, if someone is a known uh, a, a sexual criminal, they won't be able to drive a car. The whole scandal over companies like Uber is that they demand to be unregulated. So that's why the internet at the moment is not the answer. We need more regulation. I mean, let me just come back to one other thing. This guy before us gave the presentation on the dark web, and you stand up and say, well, are you going to tell us how we're going to make money out of the dark web? Just you know how you make money. By by, by, by Selling passports? No, by, by monetizing pedophilia. I mean, 65% of the people on the dark web are pedophiles. So these are serious issues. It's not a joke anymore. This is changing everything from transportation to healthcare. It's just the beginning, as the D DLD people say. It's not just media anymore, Mike. This is a serious issue. We're changing if, the world. If you want to create more jobs, uh, you want to create more jobs for regulators. Are you anti-regulation? Are you a libertarian? Are you saying that no regulation is the solution? Let's go back to the way. Well, let a me happy finish. medium between the two. Happy medium, absolutely. I just talked to Vivian Redding. The point about people like Kalalnik uh, and Thiel and these other hardcore libertarians is they want any regulation. Let's go back to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. If we hadn't had regulation, uh, we'd still have 11-year-olds in factories. We'd still have factories belching so much pollution into cities that they'd be uninhabitable. We'd still have these uh, robber barons behaving so badly, like the Travises of the world, that we'd be disgusted by them. We need regulation. This isn't big oil. You're not talking about polluting the environment. It's not that different from big oil. I would argue that data is the new pollution. I would argue that just as the Greens focused on pollution in the industrial age, the equivalent of pollution is data and privacy and secrecy and all these other issues that are irresolvable. G German audience, right? How would you... <laughs> privacy, privacy, all is privacy. You How, don't agree? You don't about, agree? What about the Arab Spring? It's what about the Arab Spring? People okay, were let... able to talk to what each other. What about the Arab Spring? The, people were able to talk to each other on Facebook, on Twitter. Oh, uh, wonderful, houses, wonderful, tell, wonderful, mate. Stand up against What about dictators? the Arab Spring? What about... Act what about... Tunisia. What, what about Tunisia? What about Occupy? None of it has grown up. None of it is developed into a coherent political system or movement. When was the last time you ever heard about Occupy? Look what happened to the Arab Spring. It's degenerated into the Arab catastrophe of genocidal civil wars. Now, I'm not blaming Twitter or Facebook for that, but we don't hear about how Twitter or Facebook is changing the Arab world because it's a lot of garbage. Right? Let's go. I mean, <laughs> Right, let's get What to... about the Arab Spring? It's exactly the right question. You could have written my book for me. Well, and my next book is actually going to be entitled right. What about the Arab Spring? Who, who would you want to regulate the internet then? Vivian Redding, you want uh, 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 the, uh, the, the EU to Ooh, regulate the Mike, internet? Do you want a the, real you want the Americans to regulate uh, the internet? Uh, Mike, a politician regulating? Wouldn't that be Who, awful? Uh, Vivian Redding, she's not in the audience. The domain she's a domain name friend of system, mine. the open domain name system regulate the internet? Who do you want? Do you want the dark web shut we, down? I would like the dark web to be shut down if it could. I don't think it can be. Can it be? I mean, that's the whole point of the dark web is it can't be shut down. But we need regulation in the set on the internet in the same way as we need regulation in society. This is not a marginal business. It's not a sideshow. Let me just yesterday. But let, but let me answer the question. 
Who gets to regulate? Yeah, sure, people like Vivian Redding, people at the EU, people, at, uh, people in the Houses of Parliament, people in Congress. I was, uh, I was in DC Elected, early. elected Absolutely, people. elected people, uh, people on the FCC. We've got to understand. Elected people who don't understand technology. How do you know? They, when was the by, last time? By the way they regulated it at the moment. Well, I, I've spent a lot of time with, uh, with Jessica Rosenworcel, one of the FCC commissioners. I would argue she knows certainly more than, about technology than I do, and perhaps as much as you. And she will argue, and this is the key argument, is that regulators create innovation. Take the example of Google. Google, as we all know, is the new Microsoft. Google is the new monopolist. They're stymieing startups. They are very, very aggressive in terms of the way in which they crush opposition. We need regulators to go after companies like Google and perhaps Amazon to encourage innovation. So regulation is pro-innovation. It works in favor of innovation. Yesterday, Mark Andreessen was quoted. More, more, uh, come on. Yesterday, yesterday, Mark Andreessen was quoted in the Financial Times as saying that the future is Japan. The future is we need more technology. We are living in an aging society. We're not having enough children. Uh, we need technology to sort, uh, sort this out. We need robotics. Well, we need artificial how's, intelligence. How's technology going to get us more children? If, how, you how mean you like artificial to... children? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, what does Perhaps. that mean? Um, well, have you seen a movie called AI? Um, there, we, we need no. more technology, we need more innovation, we need, we need more and more and more, more internet. We don't need less, we need, don't need more regulation. We need innovators to come up with the solutions for tomorrow. We're living in an aging society, the, uh, Western Europe and, and the US is not having enough children, uh, that kind of but thing. But what has not having enough children got to do with technology? The reason we're not having enough children is because we're all on our iPhones rather than having sex. <laughs> I, I don't see the connection. I, I don't explain it. What do you mean Smart. by that? That I mean, may be the case, yes. Um, in fact, I think I know of a device, something that might help you in that regard. Um, and look, in defense of Andreessen, who I respect, you know, he's someone who's taking a stand on some of this stuff. I really respect him that he's come out publicly and say he won't invest in, no, in anonymous networks like Secret. We need more guys like Andres, and I think you've misrepresented him on the technology and sex. Well, it was, just a, it was just a quote, that's all. It wasn't, you know. Well, his it was whole from ha him having lunch with Catherine yes, Daniels, correct, right? In yes. the FT. Yeah. So maybe they had too much to drink. Perhaps, yes. Well, they didn't get to their main course very quickly. Um, look, you're living and saying there's a negative. You, you say in the book there's a negative feedback loop in which we network users are its victims rather than its beneficiaries. Yes. Me? Let, let's, let's take it each other. Right, you're on Twitter, you're on Facebook. No, I'm you're not on Facebook. You're promoting your book. You're I'm using the internet to promote your... I'm not on Facebook. I, I apologise, you're not on Facebook. But you, uh, <laughs> you're, uh, you're using the internet to promote your book, are you not? You're a beneficiary, are you not? You know, th it, this is one of the most annoying questions that I always get. Any time I do one of these things, someone like Mike thinks they've come up with a really good idea and say, Oh, you're critical of the internet, but you use Twitter. Oh my God. <laughs> I make it clear in the book that firstly, the internet is, is very beneficial. I like it as much as you. I'm as wired as much as you. The reality is, is that we cannot boil down these arguments to personal issues. The reality is whether or not I use Twitter is neither here nor there. The real issue, three issues, Mike, is this revolution compounding fundamental inequality, which is something that even people at DLD are bothered with. Is this revolution, as McAfee, I think, really believes, is it undermining work? And thirdly, is it creating this vast panopticon, this surveillance economy, where everything we do, everything we think, everywhere we go, is going to be watched by some commercial company, then we get packaged up and sold back to advertisers. That's the issue, not whether or not I use Twitter. So what? To be devil's advocate, the surveillance society managed to find Osama bin Laden because he was the only guy... On Twitter, right? ...in, in the village. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, he was... Uh, I remember I, uh, writing an article about how his assassination was live tweeted from Abbottabad. Um, so are we saying that Osama bin Laden wouldn't have been found without Twitter? I'm saying that he what was found... What about the Arab Spring? He was what found, about Obama? I mean, he was found because he wasn't on the internet. He was the wealthiest man in that village that wasn't on the internet. So you're saying if you really want to hide, you go on Twitter? 
I'm saying if you really want to hide, you get off the grid. Well, I think in the future, by 2025, Ericsson says by 2020, there'll be 50 billion connected devices. By 2025, almost everyone will be on the network, which explains why this is such a profound revolution. The only people who won't be on the network are the, the super rich who don't need to be, and the super poor, the homeless. But everyone else will be on it. Um, but prior to this revolution, I couldn't rent out my apartment on an Airbnb. Oh, I couldn't take a... I, could, I would have to buy a car to get around town. Now I can take an Uber or whatever. Yeah, when it rains, you have to pay 15x the fare. Uh, and, you ha and, and you rent out your apartment mm. and you don't pay tax. These things aren't necessarily bad, but they need to be regulated. And the sharing economy, as I explain in a full chapter in my book, is creating a new class, the precariat people who have no security, very, very different kind of working class from even the proletariat. It's not a world people want. We don't want to be selling our labor on TaskRabbit for 15 minutes so we can queue up for one of these people for an iPhone. We don't want to be supposedly, quote unquote, employed by Travis at Uber. And then if you have a terrible crash and run a kid over, they deny you even work for them. There's a fundamental structural problem with this economy. That's what I'm describing in the internet's not the answer. That's why at the moment the internet's not the answer. That's why these companies both need to be regulated and need to show much more respect for their workers and for the consumers. Surely nobody's ever going to agree to regulate the internet. No, there's going to be no agreement. The Russians will want to regulate it, the Chinese, uh, Obama, you name it. There's never going to be... A, a, it's a pipe dream. It's a pipe dream. Well, there will be no regulation. There's a de facto regulation. The Chinese, the Russians, the Iranians already regulate their internet. And one of the... And do you think that's the answer? Did I say that was the answer? The, the reality is that the old utopian dream of a global network, the thing that was articulated by people like Tim Berners-Lee, who I respect a great deal, I, I discuss him in my book, uh, uh, John Perry Barlow, this idea that the internet would unite the world for better or worse, is not going to happen. The internet reflects the world. The world is made up of great powers and states, and the internet is fragmenting into that world. I'm not necessarily saying that's a good thing, but it's a reality we have to acknowledge. Surely it's a fantastic ability for ordinary people to express themselves. Look what Charlie Hebdo, Je suis Charlie. With the ability for the common person on the street to oh, be yes. able to have a voice. Well, the common person on the, on the street can tweet... Je suis Charlie. So what? How is that manifesting itself in real political terms? How is the internet generating coherent political movements for change? How is the internet creating a challenge to the inequality, the joblessness? How is the internet even challenging large companies like Google and Facebook? It's a platform for narcissism. It's a selfie economy. It's not social. The very nature, the truth of the social economy or the social, the social web is it's antisocial. It's all being fragmented into this increasingly atomized and alienated individualism. That's why the Arab Spring didn't mature into anything more coherent. That's why we don't hear anything, anything more on Occupy. We're living in the current moment. At the moment, we're obsessed with Je suis Charlie. Next week, it will be something else. We've lost the collective memory. We're living, as Douglas Rushkoff says, in the tyranny of the present. Uh, Jérôme Lanier, my friend, says, I miss the future. He's right, and I miss the past. Uh, so the real tyranny is the current, and the real tyranny is the way in which we perpetually broadcast ourselves without any real political or sociological uh, significance. A few years ago, it was said that you could fit the, the entire library of Alexandria of ancient history on one terabyte, gig, uh, one terabyte uh, hard drive. Now, we're talking about terabytes of data passing across the internet every second. Uh, you talk about the collective memory, but the collective memory, uh, if, you, if you remember, is about not repeating history. Those who cannot re remember history are condemned to repeat it. But our collective memory is being, uh, being created every second of every day. We're not, we don't need to repeat history because history is now archived forever. So, Mike, are you saying that this current digital, de di di uh, di digital generation is more historically sophisticated than previous generations? Are you saying that they're more... They, they may be Their more access to history is greater than yeah, ever before. Yeah, but it's not so... It, it, it Look isn't. at Wikipedia. Look at Wikipedia. It's full of errors. Nine out of ten uh, people... Uh, nine out of the ten medical entries, for example, are wrong. So 
it's, it, it's, it's not really educating. It's not deepening knowledge. There's a huge amount of data. I mean, every year there are more photographs taken and more photographs posted than in the history of the world. But they're selfies. They're, 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 they're self-photographs of people at, at Auschwitz or in front of masterpieces. People have lost any sense of their own role in history. We've gone back, as I explain in my perhaps book... Perhaps they're taking it, they're owning that, it for themselves. That we've gone back, as I say in my book, to a pre-Copernican universe where the world revolves around us. We've degenerated into this terrible narcissism. We can't blame it on technology. There are lots of other forces, but the internet is playing a very problematic role in all that. What about the Arab Spring? <laughs> what about the Arab Spring? Do we want to have any questions? I don't really care about your questions. Um, uh, where, where can you go after this? You've written... I'm going to go many, upstairs. You've written many books about the cult of the amateur, against amateurism, for the professional, about digital narcissism, about... No, I, 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 hold on, where can you go from here? Let me just... Where think, can you go from Mike here? is dismissing my work. I wrote a book in 2007 called Cult of the Amateur, which argued not against amateurs. It was a misunderstanding. I argued that this current internet economy was not supporting professional artists. It wasn't enabling a viable economy for journalists, photographers, uh, filmmakers, writers. And at the same time, there was a book called The Long Tail Written, which argued the reverse. I would strongly argue my book looks a lot better now than Chris Anderson's book, because we have a crisis of photographers and journalists. It's harder and harder to make money online. So that book was right. Then in, a couple of years ago, I wrote a book called Digital Vertigo which was a focus on our emerging surveillance economy. It came out a year before the NSA. So I, I, I've been right in terms of predicting what's going on. Uh, I'm very interested in big forces. I'm interested in artificial intelligence. I'm interested in labor. These are huge issues which change everything. I was just at CES. It's not just the media business anymore. Uh, our, our network society is changing automotive, it's changing healthcare, it's changing education. The revolution is only just beginning. That's why we need more responsibility. And that's why, from a, te a, a, a tech press point of view, we need guys like you to be more critical of people like Travis. So when he says, oh, I'm going to make 50,000 jobs, you need to look at that more critically and say, what is he really saying? Because these people have got away with it for years. They promised us they promised us 10 or 15 years ago, they said, well, there's going to be an economy where musicians will be able to make money, which will create this kind of cornucopia for creatives, and the reverse has happened. So I don't see the future in the way you do, and I think so far I've been proved to be right. One last question. Peter Thiel argues in his book, and, and again, he argues that... Uh, Although you might get te the internet often tends towards monopolies in terms of Facebook, Twitter, etc., other people come along and then disrupt those uh, opportunities. You don't need antitrust regulation. You don't need antitrust inquiries. Look, Peter. You, okay, you, so you, you can create a better Google. You can create a better Twitter, a better Facebook. So I don't know how many of you have read. If Peter. you don't have regulation. Okay, so are you an anarchist? Are you a libertarian? I'm asking you the question. So, so Peter Thiel, who is a, distinct, a, a noted and very smart libertarian, just wrote a book called Zero to One. And there are two aspects of that book which are deeply problematic. The first that he says is that monopolies are good things. He says society benefits from monopolies and entrepreneurs should try to create monopolies. He doesn't recognize the anti-innovative nature of monopolies. And the second problem with Thiel is that he turns the the entrepreneur, maybe this is some, something to do with his German background, but he turns the entrepreneur into the ubermensch as the person driving history forward. He presents the entrepreneur, the technology innovator, as the only person who can change the world. He's deeply hostile to government. He sees government as the enemy. He backs Rand Paul and the other libertarians in America. And I think people like Thiel are not only politically dangerous, but they gave this community an incredibly bad reputation. And there are other people, like Andreessen or like Reid Hoffman, who are much more responsible, and their voices need to be heard, because at the moment, people like Thiel and Kalalnik are doing a bad job for our industry. If you were going to... 
If you were going to uh, advise these people to go from here, from this place, go out into the world, what would you advise them to do about this problem that you recognise? Which people? Well, these people here. What, what should they do if, if, uh, if this is the... Well, the first thing, of course, they need to do the is... The problem read, that we face. ...buy and read my book. Um, they need to take responsibility for their actions. There's the, the famous General Powell, Colin Powell thing about Iraq or Kuwait, one of those words where he said, you know, you, you break it, you fix it. And we have a responsibility to breaking, uh, not to breaking, we have a responsibility to fixing what we break. We have to understand that our collective revolution, just as the revolution at the beginning of the 19th century, is creating untoward huge amount of suffering, unemployment, anxiety. We're comfortable with it. We're the, the new dominant class. We're the elite. We need to take responsibility for that. We need to invent businesses that respect labor. We need to invent businesses that offer consumers real choice rather than turning them into product. We need to create businesses that don't exploit labor like Amazon does. We have a responsibility, just as the entrepreneurs in the Industrial Revolution did, to create a world that we want to live in. And at the moment, we're not doing that. So most of the people here are entrepreneurs or investors. If they're investors, don't invest in nasty businesses. Follow Andreessen. Recognize that you shouldn't be investing in anonymous networks that lend themselves to bullying and teenage suicide. Don't invest in companies like Amazon, which with their cult of the consumer have created a world where workers are more and more exploited in their distribution centers. We need to respect unions. Uh, look critically at the sharing economy, because it's not about sharing. It's this very ambitious play by Wall Street and Silicon Valley to create new global monopolies. That's why Uber's worth $40 billion. And with a company like Uber, don't view the regulators as the enemy. They're your friend, they create innovation, and they will create a viable long-term economy. Without regulation, this economy is screwed. Andrew King, thank you very much. Thank you. What a